All right, turn to Genesis chapter 8. I had Stephen read Psalm 29, had that, him do that for a reason. Psalm 29 has to do with the Lord's power, the Lord's supremacy, especially over the forces of nature. Uh, I just want to point out one verse. We're not doing an exposition of Psalm 29 here. I want to point out one verse from Psalm 29, verse 10. It says, the Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The word translated flood in Psalm 29 is the exact same word used in the account of the Genesis flood back in chapters 6 through 9. And uh, because of that connection, many see that, that this is Psalm 29 is, 10 is talking about the flood in Genesis. Of course, somebody always has to debate these things. Others think that it's a flood that could happen, any, any flood at all that happened, any force of nature, uh, the destructive force of nature that takes place, but whichever it is, the Lord is supreme over the forces of nature, without a doubt. He's king over those forces. He's king over nature, and he sits as king forever. So I am applying the, uh, the thought of Genesis, or rather Psalm 29.10 to Genesis, the Genesis flood, because I, I know that I can, that the Lord sat as king over that flood as well. Now, in referring to the flood, we often talk about Noah's ark, or we talk about Noah and the flood. We use that terminology, and that's correct. Both of these are terms are correct to say that. But what, what if we talked about, if we got really technical about this, we could say this is God's ark. Couldn't we say that? This is God's flood because he's the one who initiated it. He's the one who is sovereign over the flood, the whole, the whole thing. And God did, his, did sit as king over the Genesis flood. I know he did. And he sits over, as king over every flood and over every force of nature. And so tonight, as we consider God as the one being sovereign over the flood, I want us to look at three actions taken by the Lord in Genesis chapter 8, three actions. The first action is in verses 1 to 14, God remembers. God remembers. Now, forgive me for the very, very slim notes I gave you. That's called running out of time. And uh, time's always a, a challenge and always a problem. I'll try to maybe beef that up throughout this week for you, but... God remembers, look at verse, the beginning of verse 1, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. Now that strikes me as a very strange statement. Why does it say God remembered Noah? Did he forget about Noah? Did he forget that he was on the ark? Is it possible that God is forgetful? That he doesn't, not able to retain things in his memory? Well, the answer to that obviously is a resounding no. We know that. The ones with the memory problem are us, not him. Sometimes we have a selective memory problem. Sometimes we choose not to remember certain things and other things we like to forget about in our past. But the Lord does say in Jeremiah 31, 34, he says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. That, that's what we want to talk about when we talk about the Lord's memory, right? He will remember our sins no more. That's not because he has a memory lapse either. It's just his way of saying, I fully and freely forgive sins. This is a complete, I do a complete work of forgiveness when I forgive, and that's the way to look at that. But what does it mean when it says here, God remembered Noah? The first word in this sentence is a word of a term of contrast, but God. Now, you have to go, when you see that, you have to go back to the previous passage. And when you go back to chapter 17, verses, or, or chapter 7, rather, not 17, chapter 7, verse 17. Through 23, the evil world outside of Noah's family is literally being destroyed. There's a flood. God said he would send this. He would literally destroy the world. He did. Look at verse 23 of chapter 7. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. And so he goes on, you go into chapter 8, verse 1, it says, But God, remember Noah. Devastation, destruction everywhere, but God remembers Noah. Do you see the contrast? The contrast between the, the world of evil people who God talked about that in chapter 6 being destroyed, and then the contrast, but God remembers Noah. The Lord has a special interest for his people, a special love for his people. They're very dear to him. And even those who are associated with the righteous are included in this. Noah's family is included. Uh, the animals are included, it says here. 
And uh, it says, but in fact, verse 1 says, God remember Noah and all the beasts, the cattle that were with him. These are wild beasts, even. Why, why does he remember the beast? Why does he remember the animals? It's because the animals were necessary for the survival of the human race after this. They had to have them, and also for the purposes of sacrificing to God. So the animals also are remembered by God. Now this concept of God re, God's remembering has to do with his faithfulness. He's faithful to his people. Part of this goes back to chapter 6, verse 18. If you would, go back to 618. And before the flood, God says, But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. You shall enter the ark, you and your sons, your wives, and your family. God's going to establish his covenant. And God's going to be faithful to his covenant. He's going to be faithful to take care of his people, and he is, and he, and he shows that throughout the flood. Now get this, God will not abandon the people to whom he commits himself. He will never abandon the people to whom he commits himself. He's committed himself to you, his people. He'll not, he'll not abandon you. When spoken of God, that term remembrance, when used of God, uh, he'll do, it means he'll do something for his people. He's going to do something for his people. Even in the midst of a flood, he's going to do something for his people. Now, according to one Hebrew dictionary, this uh, term remembrance implies a remembrance, a remembering with kindness. He's remembering his people. He's remembering Noah with kindness, with, uh, 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 with protection, with deliverance. In that manner, is he doing it? In other words, God's looking out for Noah. God's looking out for the people on the ark. He's going to ensure their deliverance. He's going to ensure their protection. The storm that's raging everywhere. Think about being Noah in the ark and all the family there. Storms raging, you've been promised by God. But God's going to show his concern for the welfare of Noah. And this remembrance of God moves him to action. Look at verse 1 again. And it says, God remembered Noah, all the beasts, all the animals, and what did he do? And God caused the wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. God remembered Noah, so he caused the wind to pass over and begins... The, the subsiding of the, of the water. Look at verse 2. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Now, God's action starts turning this flood around, starts to turn it around. And just to show you who's in charge, go back to chapter 7, verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 11 says this, 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. We just read this in chapter 8. All the fountains of the great deep burst open, the floodgates of the sky were opened. So God caused the floodgates of the sky to open and rain came down. And then now he causes the floodgates to stop and he restrains that rain from falling down. Before the flood, he opens the, he opens the subterranean rain, the fountains of the deep, we call the subterranean area. He opens those fountains of the deep, and now he closes them. Who sits as king over the flood? God does. He sits as king over the flood. The flood is divinely ordained and divinely controlled by God himself. The same thing is true of the Exodus, when the Lord uh, parted the Red Sea. Again, he's supreme over the forces of nature. That's amazing Incredible power. Psalm 29 is a psalm about God's incredible power, among other things. This is the amazing power of God. Now, do we see a similar thing in the New Testament happening? Yes, we do. Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, uh, we see in those instances in the gospel when there's a storm, Jesus is king over the storm. And one of these instances in, is in Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Luke 8, 22, it says this, Now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, Jesus fell asleep. Is, is Jesus worried about anything here? He's not worried about anything, period. That's how, actually, that's how we should be. And a fierce, here's what happened. He falls asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they begin to be swamped and to be in danger. This is a serious storm taking place. Jesus is asleep. They came to Jesus and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. You can feel their frightened wor their words 
uh, their fright spoken in their words here, were perishing, and Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where's your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? He commands even the winds and the water. Mind you of anything that happened in Genesis? The disciples were fearful. Now, naturally speaking, if we're in a storm at sea, and I've read a lot of history about people who went exploring in ships centuries ago and storms would hit, and that was always a terrifying experience for these people. Naturally speaking, we would be afraid to be on the ocean in a storm. But that is not how Jesus sees it. As far as he's concerned, there's no need to be afraid. There's no need to be frightened at all. Jesus knew he was king over the winds and the waves. He sat as king. And I couldn't help but think of the hymn, Be Still My Soul. I love the hymn, Be Still My Soul. Uh, I love the line that says, Be still my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. They know. They know who's in charge. Who's, Jesus is in charge of his boat. God's in charge of his ark. I don't know what kind of inward emotions Noah experienced on the ark. I don't know what kind of inward emotions the family experienced. I don't know if any of the animals got a little restless with the storm outside. I can imagine they can hear the storm. Put yourself, try to put yourself in the ark with, that, with what's going on. You can hear the storm raging. I mean, now, some, now, being in Florida, you can relate to this a little bit, okay? Because we have these ridiculous storms that hit. Storms howling, maybe thunder, maybe lightning, maybe heavy rains. They hear this. Lightning bolts. You know, the lightning bolts in Tampa. I'm not talking about the hockey team, Ken. The lightning bolts in Tampa. Ken's going to go right to the lightning. I know he is on that one. Are scary often, aren't they? And then you hear, boom! It's a, a power a power surge or whatever. And, man, sometimes that can shake you up. And even little kids, I've had them... We've had the grandchildren over. Sometimes they're, they're running to you. They're scared. I've seen dogs run in front for cover. The people in the ark could hear what was going on. Think about that, what they heard. Think about what they felt. They could feel the ark moving aimlessly about. There's no navigation taking place here. They're just being tossed and turned. Uh, they're, they're riding along. It's, the, the winds are rising and falling. Look at chapter 7, verse 17. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark. Woo! <laughs> so it rose above the earth. Can you imagine that? How that would feel? What's going on out there? All this action. Do you think anybody on the ark was frightened? I don't know. It, it could very well be they, that some of them were frightened, but I can tell you this, the Lord cares for his own. We don't have to be frightened. And this, even if you're on the ark, you don't have to be frightened because God said, I'm going to get you through this thing. They have his word. They have to believe his word by faith. And we don't have to be frightened at the circumstances. Now, it's easy for me to say this behind a pulpit. Or is it easy to say this behind a pulpit? Uh, you, can, you can, you know, people, naturally speaking, as I said, we are afraid of many circumstances that trouble us greatly. However, the Lord says we don't have to be. We can trust the one who is king over all these circumstances. He's king over the flood, right? Be still my, the song says, be still my soul. The Lord is on thy side. We don't have to be worried or frightened or anxious about the circumstances of life. We have a, right now in America, we have a lot of circumstances that are making people very anxious and frightened and worried and all that, I understand. However, who do we trust? Who's king over all this stuff? We trust the king of kings. Verse 3, and the water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Notice that the Lord could have cleared up everything right away. He could have done that, but he does not. He does stop the subterranean waters underneath, from below. We talked about that last week, chapter 7. That was part of the reason why the flood took place. He stops the rain from above. Now, by the way, you can look on the websites, Answers in Genesis, ICR, all that, and you can find the scientific data, backing all, you know, under, understanding of all this. I'm no scientist. Don't pretend to be one. I don't even pretend to be one in the pulpit. But God allows the natural processes to take place takes 150 days for the waters to recede, or literally, it says, to return, to go back, and to return to normal. That's, that's also in chapter 7, verse 24. Chapter 7 and 8, by the way, do you notice all the exact numbers? 
chapter 7, chapter 8, all these exact numbers, like, for example, 150 days, 40 days, 7 days, keep saying this. The Bible could have just said it's going to rain for a good while, and eventually uh, the waters are going to recede, but no, it doesn't say that. Instead, it, you know, all these exacting numbers, it says it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, exactly. It's going to be 150 days for this receding to take, take place. And one of the things I love about the Bible is these exacting details. Those are not, again, as I've said before, those details are not meant to bore us. They're pointing out the accurate portrayal of what actually happened in history. Finally, in verse 4, the ark comes to a halt. Look at verse 4. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of, I'm going to call it a rare rat. That's what we're used to hearing. It actually says it rested on the mountains, plural, of a rare rat. That's a mountain range, by the way, not just one mountain. It actually, actually exists. All these things exist in the Bible, the historical. Obviously, the ark came to resting place on one of those mountains of the mountain range called a rare rat. It's in modern day Turkey. And uh, although there's been a lot of talk over the years about people looking for the ark, people, many people over the years have looked for the ark. They've done archaeological searches for it. They've tried to discover it. People have said they've discovered it. People have said, oh, I think I saw it. Planes have tried to take pictures of something. I think there's an object down there that may be an ark. No one has actually officially discovered it. it hasn't happened yet. And although that would be a great archaeological find, I would love to, to see that. It's not necessary to our faith. You have to understand that. It's not necessary to our faith to find it. Our, our faith is not based on an archaeological find, even of a biblical nature. As much as I love that subject, and you know, I think it's a fascinating subject, archaeology, it's interesting when they do a dig and, and bring up a historical find that actually confirms what the scripture says. I love it. Like the Hittite Empire, very interesting subject. But our faith does not rest on archaeology. But rather, as the old hymn, yet another old hymn says, my faith has found a resting place. And where is that resting place? The hymn says, my heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. It's the written word of God that's the sure foundation. Why are we always telling people to read the Bible? Because that's our foundation what it's all about. Now, the providential hand of God can also be seen in the place, the location where it landed on a mount, the mountains of Ararat. Uh, I say that because it's centrally located in the world. That, that you, could, you can travel east into Asia from there, from that area. You can travel west into Europe. You can travel south into Africa. The creation scientist Henry Morris said, Modern computer studies have shown that the geographical center of the Earth's land areas is located within a short distance of Mount Ararat, a coincidence that can hardly be other than providential. By the way, this mountain range of Ararat does have a mountain called Mount Ararat in it, a single mountain. Henry Morris also says the Ararat region, also including Mount Ararat, itself a mountain in the chain, is actually about 17,000 feet tall. This is a big mountain, Mount Ararat itself. Now, this is a range of mountains here. The biggest one is Mount Arara, 17,000 feet or so tall. This is a big mountain. Listen to this. That, the, the, they've done many scientific studies of that area. The water abounds in pillow lava, a dense lava rock formed under great depths of water. The mountain also includes certain sedimentary formations concerning marine fossils. Marine fossils. Now, why would a mountain have marine fossils on top of it? Maybe because there was a worldwide flood? Who knows, right? Another scientist, Andrew Snelling, says this, deep under Mount Ararat are thousands of feet of flood sediments. This is under the mountain. Filled primarily with marine fossils. I heard Henry uh, Morris uh, came to Tampa one time and talked about the marine fossils that were all over the place. These, Andrew Snelling says, these are similar to flood layers we find all over the earth. The same thing. Marine fossils all over the place. According to verse 5, uh, it says the waters decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains are visible, became visible so they could see the tops of the mountains. Now let me read verses 6 to 12 as a unit. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. He didn't open the door, he opened the window. <laughs> you don't want to open the door right now. And he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated, decreased from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place. You see these terms, resting place. Remember the name Noah means rest, by the way. It could be a play on words throughout this chapter. No resting place for the sole of her feet. 
So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the, ark from the, the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. So in this, this is the famous section where we have this story of the, the raven and the dove, and you see this in kids' coloring books, right? You see they're coloring, I think maybe we have that tonight, they're coloring ravens and doves, and this is where it came from. And after 40 days on the mountain of Ararat, or the range at least, Noah sends out a raven. Now later on, a raven's going to be listed as an unclean bird in, in Leviticus. A raven is like, kind of like a crow, it can eat anything. Especially will it eat carrion. Carrion is the decaying flesh of dead animals or dead human beings. And, and uh, the raven will eat that. And so Noah knows this information with all those dead animals and people. He sends out the raven to find out, to, to test the waters, so to speak, see if there's, is, is the land dry? He doesn't know what's going on. The raven was neither good to eat, wasn't good for food, wasn't good for sacrifice, so it would not be a great loss if it didn't come back. The text doesn't say, people say, did the raven come back? And they have a big discussion about that. I don't know if he came back or not. But I'll tell you one thing. His wife was on board the ark, the raven's, the raven's wife. And if he didn't come back, he's never going to hear the end of it, probably. So the raven is first. Then Noah sends out a dove to see if the waters were abated, if they had decreased. Uh, but unlike the, the, the raven, the dove, dove does not just keep flying around. This is a totally different bird. <laughs> this is a bird that would shop at Target, not Walmart. I used to work at Target when I was going to school, and so I found out the great difference between Target and Walmart. Everybody wanted cleanliness, so they'd go to Target, they would say. You know? So the dove doesn't keep flying around. He comes back to the ark, which showed Noah that you know, the water had not dried up sufficiently, and so the dove returns. To Noah, and like an expert fowler, you know, Noah's this zoologist guy, he reaches out and is able to haul the bird in. Now, while the raven's an unclean bird, the dove is a clean bird. It's going to be listed later on as a clean bird, and it's going to be used in sacrifices to the Lord, as a matter of fact. In Leviticus, it says if a person's really poor and they're sacrificing animals, they don't have the money to get some, another kind of animal, they can bring in a dove for the burnt offering, for the sin offering. You can see that in different passages in Leviticus. I'll try to get these notes to you that are real notes this week. And so, does that remind you of anybody? After some days after Jesus was born in Luke chapter 2, verses 23, 24, Joseph and Mary are poor. What do they offer? A pair of turtle doves or uh, pigeons. They, they gave the poor offering. Noah again releases the dove seven days later. This time the dove returns with a freshly... Uh, picked olive leaf in his mouth, indicating that the land is dry, showing that things are growing again on the earth. Now Noah sees some progress. Now, I'm not going to try to get carried away with excessive typology here concerning the, the dove and the raven. I've heard, listen, back in the day I heard stories that will, as somebody said, knock your socks off, all right? I heard the most entertaining sermons you can ever begin to imagine. But I'll tell you something. I will not have the raven represent the, the old sin nature. I won't have the dove represent the new uh, creation in Christ. I'm not going to have the dove or the raven represent the law and the dove represent gospel. I, I think here the raven is actually a raven and the dove is actually a dove and Noah sent them out for one purpose, to see if there's dry land. That's it. I don't have a spiritual, we don't need allegories here. I don't have a spiritual lesson for you here. Yet another seven days and Noah sends out a dove again for further testing. This time the dove does not return. Noah knows that the land is dry. Now Noah would make a, a good captain of a ship because he's very deliberate. He's very careful. He's very practical. Do you know that godly people are practical people? The people who are heavenly minded are most, most earthly good to other people. Noah's that way, but Noah has no technology on the, on the board, on board. He has no technology. He's got an old, this, this uh, you know, barge. They're floating around on. No navigation, no nothing, no fish finder. Today, people have fish finders on their boats. He has nothing, no technology at all. And so, and he doesn't know what's going on out there. So he does what's very wise. He uses what he does have on hand. He uses birds. Because God has given, given creatures 
innate abilities to do certain things. It's amazing. You watch, go in your back yard and look at the birds fly, fly in and look at squirrels and so on. You'll see they all have their own little thing they do, wisdom that God gave them. And do you know that the two guys that were officially the first to fly, fly an airplane, the Wright brothers, do you know that they spent time studying birds? I think it was Orville Wright. Studied birds, watched the birds fly. So he, and when he did that, he realized, if I do what they're, they're doing, my plane's going to fly better. And he applied those principles to his airplane. It's amazing that this is all glory goes to God on this. He made all these creatures, great and small, with wisdom. Even the lowly raven. Look at verse 13. Now it came to pass, or it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Now another time reference. We see this again and again. All these time references in verse 13. Back in chapter 7, verse 11, it talks about when the journey started. How old was Noah when the journey started? He was 600 years old. Go back to chapter 7, verse 11. 600 year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month, the journey starts. Now in chapter 18, uh, chapter 8, verse 13, it's the 601st year of Noah's life on the first day of the first month. And for, verse 14 concludes their time in the ark by saying it's the second month in the 27th day when it actually came to an end. And if you calculate all this out, it comes to approximately a year. It's 354 days for the lunar year, 365 days for a solar year. It's about a year. He's been in the, imagine that, one year, in the, one year on the ark, lots of family time together, lots of feeding of animals, I guess, lots of cleanup, I'm sure. Some people say certain animals hibernated during that time. I don't know how we know this. But what a year. How would your family do? Think about this. How would your family do for one year in an enclosed structure all together with no way of escape? How would you guys, would you get along with each other? Believers should. And if they don't, there's something wrong. In verse 13, Noah removes the covering of the ark. That's the first time we've seen that word, covering. We haven't seen that before. What is the covering? Well, er elsewhere in the Bible, it's used of the tan cowhides that made up the, uh, the cover of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And I don't know what this is, but many think it was part of the roof that Noah removed now at this point. Verse 13 says the earth was dry on the first day of the month. Here's another thing to think about. Verse 13 says the earth was dry on the first day of the month. Verse 14 says the earth was dry on the 27th day of the second month. It's almost two, later, two days too much later. So which is it? What, what day are we talking about here? Well, I don't think it's a mystery because this whole chapter is talked about drying of the earth again and again. It's been little by little. Verse 7, for example. It says the water was dried up from the earth. Yet the dove wasn't satisfied with that dryness until in, in verse 9. He's not satisfied with it. Things were drier in verse 11 when the dove picked the olive leaf, but not completely. The earth was dry enough for the dove's satisfaction in verse 12. So you can see it's always a matter of degree, and it's always a matter of who you're talking about. Are you talking about the dove, the raven, Noah, or the Lord? On what, what, when is it dry? So you can always tell it's a matter of degree. Little by little is the, is the is point here. Verse 13, Noah felt the earth was dry enough, but not until verse 14 is it good and dry. Little by little, it's drying up is the point. But the main point, the main thing to notice in verses 1 to 14 is God remembered Noah. He remembered him. That's the, how the chapter starts. He remembers his family. He remembers the animals. He brings them safely through the flood because they're his people. He told him he'd protect them. He told him he could get it through. He did get him through. He brings severe judgment upon the world, but not knowing his family. 2 Peter 2, 5 says he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. That's what he did. But he delivered the righteous through the storm because God does not forget his people. So God remembers, second action God takes, God speaks. God speaks in verses 15 and 19, look at verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, your sons' wives with you, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Now, we read those words, God spoke. 
often in the Bible, don't we? We see that, thus says the Lord, says it again and again and again. But think back a little bit. When was the last time God spoke to Noah? It was a little over a year ago. It was prior to the flood when it started chapter 7, verse 1. He started speaking to Noah, or, or maybe even before that, but he's speaking to Noah, and then, they're, and, and then he stops, and then they're in the ark for a year. All that time they're in the ark, God says nothing to Noah. There's no word from God, but because they have his instructions already. They know what to do, and, they, and they're carrying out his instructions, and they're in, they're in the ark. They're doing what they were told. And now after a year, God speaks again because it's time to speak again. There's further instructions he wants them to know. What are those instructions? Time to go out of the ark. Time to leave the ark. Four times it says it in a different ways. Verse 16, go out of the ark. Verse 17, bring out with you every living thing. Verse 18, so Noah went out. Verse 19, the animals went out. Remember, that's in contrast to, verse, to chapter 7, which kept saying, enter the ark, enter the ark. Now he's leaving the ark. What is this telling us? The same thing the whole chapter has told us. The Lord is in charge of this whole operation from beginning to end. He gives the orders. He tells them when to enter. He tells them when to exit because it's God's ark. Once again, he's king over the flood. Now notice also Noah, Noah doesn't say, he does nothing without a word from the Lord. Noah never moves until God tells him to move. When God told Noah to build the ark, he built the ark. When God told Noah to, to bring all living creatures on the ark, he did that. When God's told Noah to exit the ark, he did that. You can see it in verses 13 and 14. Noah looks at, verse 13, Noah looks out and sees the land is dry, but he doesn't leave the ark. Why? He stays approximately inside for maybe 57 more days if we're going by a 30-day month. Why? Because God had not spoken. God had not said to leave. But in verse 15, God speaks, and then Noah exits. Then he exits. Always a wise thing to do. Wait for God. Noah never moves until God speaks to him. Calvin said, Noah did not move a foot out of his sepulcher. He said, he called the ark a tomb, a grave. He said he didn't move a foot out of his tomb without the command of God. Noah always waits for God to speak. So far he said nothing. He lets God do all the talking. His response, simply to comply. But when God speaks, Noah acts. He doesn't hesitate at all. Noah walks with God. His, usually his, he's in stride with God. God's He's keeping in stride with God. He doesn't try to walk ahead of God. He's not immediately rushing ahead, calling the shots, making his own course of action. He waits for the Lord. He takes directions from the Lord. That's how he does it. Now, we are always talking and planning and scheming, but I wonder how much listening are we doing, listening to the Lord, listening to his word. How much of that are we doing? That's the problem, usually. We go ahead with some action we think is brilliant, and then we realize we made a huge mistake. Why didn't we wait on the Lord? Why didn't we seek his word? In Luke chapter 10, Jesus commends Mary because he says, she sat because she sat at his feet and listened to his word. And he says, she's chosen that good part. That's not going to be taken away from her. How much better off would we be and how much less pain would we experience if we only listened to God's word first and sought his direction about the situations we encounter in life? We kind of, people come to us and they say, what do we do about this situation? And the answer is always this, what does the Word of God have to say about this? Or what do the principles of the Word of God have to say about this? We should ask, how does the Word of God speak to the issue I'm facing? The more we seek wisdom and direction from God, guess what? The less heartache we're going to have, less misery. The less we're going to be led by our own compulsive dictates. D.L. Moody said this, in prayer we talk to God, but in Bible reading he talks to us, and we had better let him do most of the talking. The problem is we're doing most of the talking usually. Now, Moody's not saying we shouldn't pray. He's just saying we need to listen to the Word of God and take it seriously a lot more than we're doing. Now, nothing about this whole venture was easy, if you think about it. Building the ark, was that easy? No way. Building the ark with the animals, was that easy? I'm, probably not. Staying in the ark for a year, was that easy? I don't think so. Exiting the ark, was that easy on a mountain range? It could have been anywhere from 12,000, 10,000 to 17,000 feet high. I don't, I don't know that that was easy either. But there may be a number of difficulties in your life that you encounter, but believers listen to God's word no matter the difficult, how difficult it is, and they do what it says. God remembers, God speaks thoroughly, God pledges, verses 20 to 22. God pledges. Then Noah built an ark, an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, 
and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on the account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now Noah, the man of God, who walks with God, desires now to worship God. He engages in a second building project. First was the ark. Now he's going to build an altar. Notice it's called an altar to the Lord. Everything points to the Lord in chapter 7 and 8. Keeps going back to the Lord, and now an altar for the Lord. Now this is the first mention of, the, of an altar in the Bible. In chapter 4, we had Cain and Abel giving an offering. In chapter 4, we had men begin to pray on the face of the earth. But now we have our first altar. Later in Exodus 20, altar, according to God's word, is supposed to be made of earth or uncut stones. Maybe this one's like that, I don't know. But notice that this is a priority for Noah. Let me ask you a question. If you were in Noah's shoes, Noah's uh, water shoes, what is the first thing you would do after coming off the ark? What's the first thing you would do? Build some kind of a shelter maybe for the family? I get better get shelter ready. Now we're back on dry, we're back on land again. And Noah, being the practical man he was, would think of that, of course. But the first activity he engages in after getting off the ark is to worship God. That's what he does. He worships the God who brought him through this ordeal. That's the order. The order should be this: Lord first before anything we want or need. It always should be that way. Most people have that reversed. Matthew Henry said this: He begins well who begins with God. He begins well who begins with God, and I would say that is great advice. What does Noah do? He offers clean living creatures, not the unclean, the clean on the altar. Think about this. Look at verse 20. Uh, verse 20. Uh, he built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal, of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is an extravagant an offering under the circumstances. Extravagant. He could have held back, knowing, hey, I have a limited number of, of creatures to deal with here. Uh, because most of the planet, they're all dead. Uh, but he doesn't hold back. He doesn't give grudgingly or of necessity. He gives like a cheerful giver because he wants to honor the Lord. Noah's like Mary. In John chapter 12, remember Mary came in and broke that, got that costly perfume, very expensive perfume, and poured it on the feet of Jesus, anointed the feet of Jesus with it. She did that out of love, out of gratitude, because believers do that. That's how they worship the Lord in an extravagant manner. Judas Iscariot would have Mary be stingy, but she didn't do that. She worshiped the Lord extravagantly, and, God, and the Lord commends her for that. Now, later in Leviticus, a burnt offering is going to be given for sin. It's going to be given as an act of thanksgiving and worship, and it shows that the person is totally devoted to the Lord. That's what the burnt offering is all about. And so he gives this offering. Now, in these last days, Hebrews 13, verse 15, tells us what kind of offering and sacrifices were to give. Through him, it says, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. We're to offer up a sacrifice too, a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for in such sacrifices God is pleased. We too have sacrifices to offer. Sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving, helping, doing good. God's satisfied with these sacrifices. And it looks as though Noah is acting in the role of priest for his family here, like Job did. Offering for sin, that giving thanks to God, being thankful that he's back, they've made it through. And Noah, as a righteous man as he was, is still a sinner. So is his family. And so they have to offer sacrifices. And I think that Noah is doing that here. In verse 21, the Lord smells a soothing aroma coming from the sacrifices. That doesn't, now, he doesn't smell like we do. He's spirit, but... It means that the Lord is pleased for the, with the offering. He's pleased with what Noah's doing. He's pleased with the offerer and the offering. Remember, like Abel, pleased with both, the offering and the offerer. And the Lord says, I will not judge man with total destruction again. Now, the NASB has it like this. Look at verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, said to himself, literally, the Lord said to his heart, he said to his own heart, he's talking to himself, and he says, I'm not going to destroy man again. That's his pledge to us. He doesn't seek Noah's counsel. This is a self-determined pledge. And when God makes, makes a pledge, it's a guarantee. He actually states it in two clauses. He says, first of all, I will never again curse the ground, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. 
Twice, ta- twice the phrase never again is used. What about this first phrase? Is, he says, I will never again curse the ground. Is he nullifying the curse on the ground in chapter 3, verse 17? When he cursed the ground with Adam? No, he's not. For one thing, the word curse used here is different from the word curse used there in chapter 3, verse 17. This is a, a milder term. Here it means to treat lightly or show disdain. Genesis 3, 17 is a stronger term. The Lord's just saying, I'm never going to curse the earth again with the ground again with the flood. I'm not going to do that. He doubles up on the first clause by saying he'll never, he'll never destroy, never smite literally every living thing as I have done. In other words, he's not going to send a global flood again. That's what he means. In these flood, in both these uh, clauses. Why is he not going to send a global flood again? Verse 21, for because the intent of man's heart is only evil, is evil from his youth. Nothing's changed. The, the heart of man before the flood was evil. Guess what? After the flood. Well, things are different now. The flood took place. Boy, everybody got wiped out. It's, all, it's going to be a new world here. We've got a new world coming here. No, you don't. Guess what? People are still evil after the flood. Nothing's changed whatsoever. And you, all I got to do, you, you don't even have to read the Bible. You can go outside and see this. We can look at our own hearts and see this. Man is what he is. A depraved sinner. Born in sin. Now, everybody's not as bad as they could be, but all of us are sinners before God. The sin nature in desperate need of a Savior who can deliver us from sin. That Savior is Jesus. The only way that we'll be delivered from sin. If we actually got what we deserved, God would wipe every generation out with a flood. You know what Calvin said? He said if we actually got what we deserved, we would have, there would be a daily deluge, a daily flood every day. But God is determined not to. Never again, not with a flood. Verse 21 takes us back to verse, chapter 6, verse 5. Look at Genesis 6, 5 again. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. This is pre-flood. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now it says in chapter 8, verse 21, after the flood, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Similar statement, but now he focuses on the fact that man is evil from his youth, even children, even babies, have a sin nature. It's hard to believe, isn't it? You look at the cute little child and you say, well, he's such a cute little child. But he's got a sin nature and it comes out quickly. It comes out, if you if you're, have ever been a parent, you see it coming out relatively quickly and you see it coming out more as he gets older. He's, he, he or she will need a sinless savior, as we all do. We need Christ who died on the cross for sins and rose again. So the Lord is showing mercy to future generations here, including us, and by not wiping us out. We deserve that, but he's not going to do it. He's going to do so, according to verse 22, while the, look at verse 22, he's going to keep this promise up while the earth remains. As long as the earth remains, regardless of the season, whether it's seed time, the planting season, whether it's harvest, bringing in the crops, whether it's cold, or hot, or summer, or winter, or day, or night, or how about this, whether it's daylight savings time, or not. Why do I think daylight savings time is going to be in the millennium even? We can't seem to get rid of it. Whatever the season is, God's going to keep the world going and not destroy it. It's not going to cease. The regularity of the seasons, they call it. It's going to continue. Why? Because God is merciful. That's the reason why. God is merciful. He made a pledge. Not going to go back on it, but I do need to tell you one more thing as we close. This all applies while the earth remains. If you would turn with me as we as we close to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 3. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. We talked about Peter being the apostle of the flood because of so many references. Peter says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For they, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens were existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Through which at that, listen to this, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Talking about the flood we just read about. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being pres- 
reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. One day, the end's going to be with fire. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the, the Lord one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, Ken's talked about the day of the Lord coming uh, <clears throat> in the future. It will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. We talked about a flood earlier, and now we're talking about intense heat in the future. The earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people, here's the question, what sort of people ought you to be in, all, in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? The world of Noah's day was destroyed by a flood, the day of the Lord is coming in the future when the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That being the case, and knowing the seriousness of the judgment God placed on this world in the past, and knowing he's going to do it again in a different way, what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? Believers are to stand as a witness to our righteous God, just like Noah did in his day. The day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. Let's pray that the Lord will enable us to live as he's called us to live. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the comfort we derive from it, knowing that you're faithful, that we can count on you, that we can depend upon you. And the difficulties of life sometimes, uh, great difficulties of life. And we pray for everyone here tonight that, that we'll all depend upon you, we'll look to you, trust in you. Whoever is suffering tonight in a, in a position where they're going through great difficulties, we pray for them, that you'll give them grace, help them to learn to trust in you, knowing they can. Pray for Mike. We pray for his father. We pray for uh, his physical condition, his spiritual condition as well. Lord, we pray you'll continue to work in our church. Help us to stand for your righteousness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.